I am just going to talk to you guys a little bit about Gothic English architecture. It began to develop around the 10th century and incorporates traditional Gothic style aspects such as vaulted ceilings, stained glass, strong vertical emphasis, pointed arches, and flying buttresses, which are all shown here. The Gothic style emerged as a device to bring light and beauty into architecture that had primarily been strictly functional, as well as breaking ground for architectural designs enabling weight distribution and therefore heightening religious structures more towards the heavens. The English adopted these ideas and designs into their places of worship, incorporating new elements specific to the English Gothic, such as lancet windows and a squat facade. The largest English Gothic cathedral is York Minster, down here at the bottom, and the tallest is Salisbury, but the most famous and most historically significant is the Grand Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is the most complex church in the world in terms, in terms of its history, functions, and memories, perhaps the most complex building of any kind. Today, the abbey is open to the public and still used primarily for worship services, but also for holidays and other celebrations. Sixteen royal weddings have been performed here, this photo being of the most recent one. There's Kate M Middleton right there and it has been the setting for every English coronation ceremony since 1066. It is both a celebratory building and one of mourning, as over 3,000 people, primarily but not limited to royalty and religious figures, some of which, including Queen Elizabeth I, Henry V, and Henry VII, are buried within the chambers of this ancient building. It holds the most significant assemblage of sculptures throughout England, including more than 600 monuments. I had the privilege of visiting this monumental cathedral on a trip to London in 2009. I was rather young, but still could not help but be awestricken by the sheer mass of this building, as well as the intricacy and detailing of the architecture, and the ages and ages of history and ideas encompassed within a single structure. The Palace of Westminster and Westminster Abbey have together been the site of many country-shaping historical events for England, thus making it more than an assemblage of works of art or a significant push forward in English architecture, but rather a real piece of British history and a true icon for their society. The building of Westminster was an extremely long and vigorous process, taking generations and generations of brilliant thinkers to achieve the iconic building that we know today. It originated around the 10th century when King Edward built a large church in honor of the Apostle St. Paul as an addition to a small monastery. Built as a church, this monumental and iconic structure's primary and original focus attests to the religious center point for art and architecture for this day and age. This is what it was supposed to look like. It wasn't until King Henry III in the mid-13th century, this is his grave in Westminster right here, demolished the eastern wing and rebuilt the abbey with the famous Gothic style that it began to develop into the architectural brilliance that we now know today. The head architects on this project were John of Gloucester, Robert of Beverly, and most notably, Henry of Reigns. Henry specifically was very influenced by the aspects of Gothic architecture that had recently blossomed within French cathedrals, seen in the use of stained glass rather than stone, stone reliefs as in Reims Cathedral. Okay, it's beautiful. Vaulted ceilings also seen in St. Monteclou and flying buttresses notable in the beautiful Cathedral of Notre Dame. Westminster was also the home of the highest Gothic vault in all of England, reaching over 225 feet, but since has been outdone, the significance of height coming from the original Gothic style. Some noteworthy English-specific qualities of the abbey include the intricacy of its main arches moldings, the use of Purbeck marble, as well as its single aisle. Gothic cathedrals of the time primarily had double aisles. An outstanding aspect of Henry III's contribution to the chapel is its cosmati pavement an abstract, ornate, mosaic-like design. This was one of the most interesting aspects of Westminster from my perspective, though unfortunately I was only able to hear a ton about it from my tour guide rather than see it for myself because its conservation project was underway. 
This was completed in 2010 and gave it such more beautiful color. The richness and the um, things that they found out about the stone was just amazing. You can see in these pictures right here. Located in front of the high altar, as you can see in this picture below, in the Sacrarium or Sanctuary, its near 25 foot square piece is extremely captivating due to the scale placement in the room and the intricacy of the design. The pieces are led, laid into a bed of perfect marble and include various pieces of limestone, opaque glass in many colors, serpentine, and other various materials. Many of the original pieces have been found through this reclamation project as reclaimed into this piece from demolished Italian structures of the Roman period, making it extremely historical. This array of elements is cut into squares, triangles, and circles in a variety of sizes and consists of a color scheme involving yellow, green, turquoise, blue, purple, and red. This abstract cosmetic floor also contains three brass Latin inscriptions that interesting, interestingly enough refer to the end of the world. This specific aspect of the chapel, for me at least, seems rather out of place. It met its completion in 1268, which was seemingly, seemingly early for its relatively unique properties. Its abstract, rather than mathematically and proportionally accurate design, is in stark contrast with the Gothic style and the properties within the rest of the entirety of the building. The inscription referring to the end of the world has been found to be an indication to a mathematical equation involving the age and reign of King Henry III, as well as the supposed lifespans of an array of animals, and reference to the four elements. These non-religious issues inscribed in the floor of such a prestigious cathedral, and specifically in front of the high altar, seem quite strange due to their location in such a strict religious and architectural environment. This abbey is said to be an absolute masterpiece, a work of architectural genius for its time, and this is primarily due to the new Lady Chapel. This was erected by King Henry VII. Here is the only example in the whole structure of perpendicular arch architecture within the cathedral. You can see that back here in the windows. One of the most significant and iconic structures within Henry VII's chapel is the intricate fan vaulted ceiling. The architects responsible for the ceiling were supposedly Robert and William Virtue, but has of never officially been confirmed. These ornate fan vaults are anchored on transverse arches, only partially visible through the decorative nature of the fans. This ceiling's uniquely intricate design was instantly and has continued to be my favorite architectural element since my encounter with it, thus my choice of this cathedral for my paper. Though a wonder when photographed, its beauty in person is sincerely indescribable and unmatched in my personal opinion. The chapel represents the disillusion of structural Gothic into decorative fancy. The architects released the Gothic style's original lines from their function and multiplied them into the uninhabited architectural virtuosity and theatrics of the perpendicular style. Though a mouthful, the truth in this quote made it extremely memorable as I read it in our textbook, as it affirms the importance of Westminster due to its breakage of tradition and incorporation of architectural innovation, using even structural elements as a mode of decoration and beauty, such as these gorgeous ceilings. In the 1700s, Nicholas Hawksmoor designed a completion plan for the Western Towers of Westminster. Hawksmoor was unschooled in architecture, but had extreme success and fame as an architect due to his raw talent and brilliant mentors, one of which was Sir Christ Christopher Wren. He worked alongside Wren on St. Paul's Cathedral, down here in the corner, in London and Oxford Shires, Blenheim Palace, which is a pure, beautiful yellow, and one of my personal favorites, though quite less impressive than these other large buildings, is the Orangery, which he supervised as the Clerks of Works at Kensington Palace. The new churches in London and Westminster Act of Parliament in 1711 set up the Commissional 
Commissioners for Building 50 New Churches in London Project, and Hawksmoor was appointed one of two architect surveyors. He and the second surveyor, James Gibbs, designed six of the most unique churches to this day in all of England. Hawksmoor's originality within his architectural designs make him so worth mentioning. At this time, the architect as an artist's role was not to create new forms of work, but rather to emphasize the traditional English Gothic traits just in an increasingly grandeur manner. Hawksmoor really broke the typical mold of an artist at the time and combines different styles of architecture to create breathtakingly unique designs, such as this rib ribbed steeple on the top of St. George Bloomsbury Cathedral, which had never previously been seen in England or other European countries. In my opinion, it was his lack of traditional schooling in architecture that really gave him that leg up and the ability to work strictly with what he observed in cathedrals at this time and his, pers and his personal ideas, giving himself the ability to create entirely new forms of architecture free from the stereotypes of traditionally correct Gothic works. And I think this is really where he found his success. Hawksmore was chief architecture on the architect on the Westminster Project, and upon Sir Wren's passing, he took over his position as the Abbey Surveyor in 1723. These right here are the Western Towers that were arrested, erected in his design. After this last phase was executed, the Grand Westminster Abbey found its completion in 1745. The Palace of Westminster, Westminster Abbey, and St. Margaret's Church together encapsulate the history of one of the most ancient parliamentary monarchies of present times and the growth of parliamentary and constitutional institutions. Another quite noteworthy English, English chapel is the Salisbury Cathedral, which I mentioned earlier. It required over 40 years for construction and was completed in 1320. It is often compared with Amiens Cathedral, which is in France, up here in the corner, because both of them were built around the same time, making extremely apparent the differences between the traditional English Gothic and the traditional French Gothic styles, even of the exact same time period. Salisbury is said to embody the essential characteristics of the English Gothic style, making it a perfect example of comparison. It has the typical English squat facade, which you can see down in this picture, with minimal use of flying buttresses, and when they were used, it was primarily only for ornamentation. And it surprisingly only has a single tower. Though it only has one, Salisbury's tower is what upstaged Westminster's tower in height, reaching an incredible 404 feet, which was unheard of for the time, and the last aspect of the building to be completed. completed. Amiens, on the other hand, displays the all-encompassing Gothic characteristics of height in many connecting towers throughout the structure, completely dependent on flying buttresses for weight distribution, which you cannot see in this picture. Salisbury also indulges upon the English Gothic property of Purbeck Marble, which was first seen in Westminster Abbey. Its traditional Gothic trait of four-part rib vaults are made uniquely English in that they rise from corbels in the triforium, producing a strong horizontal emphasis. The Bishop of Salisbury, Richard Poor, hired architect Elias of Dereham to complete his vision for this new cathedral. It became the root of the town of New Salisbury, which became the seventh largest town in all of England within 200 years of its completion. This really, really attests to the importance of religious art and architecture at this time within European culture, as it was completely the center point of people's lives, and the significance of this specific cathedral's social repercussions within England. The concept of art within the Gothic period of architecture is enormously apparent, unmistakably, in these massive religious structures. The stained glass scenes of biblical events and figures, the time and intricacy dedicated to every single aspect, and the heightening designs fabricated with the intent that these buildings may stretch further into the heavens unambiguously affirm the fact that art within this context was strictly for religious purpose. This is only a little touch on general Gothic and English Gothic architecture, but I hope you guys find the beauty and intricacy of these ancient buildings as breathtaking as I do. Thanks so much, guys.